welcome back. So, let us continue our discussion of the arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, we now move to the uh, to uh, the arbitrage pricing theory in a detail uh, in a lot of detail rather. Uh, as far as the diversification aspect is concerned, as far as the diversification of unsystematic risks are concerned, both the arbitrage pricing theory and the CAPM are having similar uh, presumptions or uh, similar assumptions. Both the CAPM and APT agree on the diversibility or diversification of idiosyncratic risks that is the unsystematic risk component both uh, both these models agree that this part of the risk can be diversified away adequate by adequate uh, manipulation or adequate incorporation of securities into our portfolio this cancellation is called the principle of diversification although many different firm specific forces can influence the return on in any individual stock these idiosyncratic effects tend to cancel out in large and well diversified portfolios. Let me repeat, although many different firm specific forces can influence the return on any individual stock, these idiosyncratic effects tend to cancel out in large and well diversified portfolios. But the systematic issue, uh, therefore, the important issue that needs attention uh, in these kind of models, in these models of risk return trade off, uh, is the issue of systematic risk. Large and well diversified portfolios are not risk free. Although we can diversify away, we can eliminate a component of the total risk which is the unsystematic risk, but the systematic risk component remains. We have seen that through uh, mathematical exposition as well. So, nevertheless large well diversified portfolios are not risk free, because common economic forces may pervasively influence all stock returns and are not eliminated by diversification. So, although uh, some component that is the random uh, uh, random component of the total risk that arises from firm specific factors or industry factors can be diversified away and by choosing an appropriate an appropriate mix of assets the other component that uh, that cannot be diversified away that is the systematic risk is what is important and as a result of which even well diversified portfolios are not completely risk free in the capm and the APT, this common forces are called systematic or pervasive risks. The CAPM systematic risk, we have already discussed it, but it is worth recapitulating. According to the CAPM model, systematic risk depends only upon exposure to the overall market, usually proxied by a broad stock market index such as the S&P Sensex. This exposure is me measured by the cap m beta. This exposure is measured by the cap m beta, we discussed it at the beginning of the previous class. Other things being equal, a beta greater or less than 1.0 indicates greater or less risk relative to swings in the market index. So, all this we have already discussed. What about the APT systematic risk? Now, this is the fundamental part. The APT takes the view that systematic risk need not be measured in only one way. The APT is completely general and does not specify exactly what the systematic risks are or even how many of such risks exist. That is why I said in some sense the APT is a generalization of the capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model relates to only one source of risk that is the market, um, which it assumes uh, is able to capture all the components of systematic risk. However, the APT is more general. It does not specify exactly what the systematic risks are or even how many. Uh, such risks exist. These risks are believed to arise from unanticipated changes in investor confidence, interest rates, inflation, real business activity and a market index. This is an illustrative list of factors which are believed to contribute to the total systematic risk of a portfolio. 
Now, APT exposures and APT betas, every stock and every portfolio has exposures or betas with respect to each of these systematic risks. Whatever is are the number of sources of systematic risks that are identified by the analyst, uh, the relationship between the, the expected return of a portfolio and each of those risk sources is captured by the beta in relation to that risk source. So, these are these together form the risk profile, risk exposure profile in the in the uh, in the terminology of the APT model. So, the pattern of economic betas of a security or portfolio is called its risk exposure profile. The pattern of economic betas of a stock or a portfolio is called its risk exposure profile. Now, the risk exposure profile and the expected return. Uh, as I mentioned, it is this set of betas in relation to each of these risks which are identified by the analyst as contributing to the total systematic risk of the portfolio that will that will contribute to the expected return on the portfolio. So, risk exposures are rewarded in the market with additional expected return. The greater is your exposure with a reference to a particular uh, risk uh, source, the greater would be the expected return corresponding to that risk source or the cumulative expected return. The profile also indicates how a stock or portfolio will perform under different economic conditions. Thus, the risk exposure profile determines the volatility and performance of a well diversified portfolio. For example, if, a re if real business activity is greater than anticipated stocks with a high exposure to business activity such as retail stores will do relatively better than those with low exposure to business activities such as utility companies. An investment manager can control the risk exposure profile of a managed portfolio by manipulating the composition of the portfolio. Now, the portfolio performance under APT, how do we measure portfolio performance under APT? Given any particular APT style as captured by the risk exposure profile, I repeat, given any particular APT style as captured by the risk exposure profile, the difference between the manager's expected return and his actual performance is attributable to the selection of individual stocks that perform better or worse than a priori expectations. This dif difference defines the ex post APT selection. So, it is basically the difference between the expected return and the actual performance which defines or which captures the ex post APT selection uh, or the performance of the portfolio manager. Now, we come to the APT postulates. Postulate number 1, in every time period the difference between the actual realized return small r i t and the expected return for any asset that is E of R i t. Please note the expected return is the return is the expectation of the return calculated at say t equal to 0 and the uh, for a period of time t and then we measure the actual return that has been achieved over that, pi and that time t uh, with reference to a particular security i. Then the difference between the actual realized return R i t and the expected return. Expected return is obviously pre estimated that is the estimate of the return or the expectation of the return at t equal to 0 in respect of the time period 0 to small t. Uh, so, in every time period the difference between the actual realized return that is R i t and the expected return for any asset that is E of R i t is equal to the sum is equal to the sum over all risk factors of the risk exposure that is represented by beta. Of course, the risk exposure is in the APT model, the risk exposure is captured by the family of betas or the sequence of betas or the set of betas and multiplied by the realization that is the actual end of period value for that risk factor plus a factor that we usually term as epsilon i, which is the asset specific it idiosyncratic 
error term. So, the difference between the actual return and the expected return is represented by the sum of the product of the various risk factors multiplied by the realizations of these various risk factors at the end of the period plus a random error term that we kept that we is believe is to represent the unsystematic risk or the asset specific risk or the IDO syncretic risk. So, this is represented by equation number 1, the statement that I read out just now is represented by equation number 1. RIT as I mentioned is the total return on asset I that includes capital gains, dividends realized at the end of period T. E of RIT is the expected return at the beginning of the period T that is the estimate or, or the expectation of the return over the period T at the beginning of T that is let us say T equal to 0 for the, for the immediately following time interval 0 to small t. Beta i j is the exposure or beta of asset i in relation to risk factor j. Beta i j is the most important quantity perhaps, it represents the risk exposure of the asset i to risk factor j. j can vary from 1 to k, we are assuming that there are k risk factors which contribute to the generation of expected return on a given security i. F j t is the value of the end of period realization for the jth risk factor. I repeat F j t is the value of the end of period realization for the jth factor. Please note these are random variables F j 1, F j 2, F j 3 up to F j k are random variables they represent risk sources. So, uh, just as we have the, the uh, market return in the case of CAPM uh, ca and the market return is a random variable and it contributes to the uh, uh, overall return on the security i. Similarly, this uh, factors f 1 t, f 2 t, t uh, f k t are all random variables and what it says is f j t is the actual realization of these random variables at the point t equal to t. And epsilon i t as I mentioned is the value of the end of period asset specific uh, idiosyncratic shock or risk. It is assumed that the expected value of all the factor realizations and for the asset specific shock are 0 at the beginning of the period. Uh, we make this assumption that the expected value for all the factor realizations and for the asset specific shock are 0 at the beginning of the period. Please note this does not in any way disturb the generality of the problem. We can always rescale this uh, uh, factors f i, uh, the values of f i at realization to account for this particular assumption. So, this is essentially a simplifying assumption that helps us in um, uh, maintaining or reducing the complexity of the problem. Uh, I repeat this assumption, it is assumed that the expected value of all the factor realizations and for the asset specific shock are 0 at the beginning of the periods. It is also assumed that the asset specific shock is uncorrelated with the factor realization. Now, please note the as I as we have discussed again in the Kappa model, the uh, uh, idiosyncratic risk or the epsilon term is also a random variable. So, we assume that uh, uh, R m and epsilon i are independent of each other, they are not correlated with each other and this assumption is carried forward in the APT model which also assumes that the uh, idiosyncratic uh, risk or the idiosyncratic shock uh, is uh, not uh, correlated with any of the factors. So, any of the systematic risk factors are not correlated with the idiosyncratic risk of the uh, security. Finally, all of the factor realizations and the assets, asset specific shocks are assumed to be uncorrelated across time. I repeat, finally, all of the factor realizations and asset specific shocks are assumed to be uncorrelated across time. In other words, they represent a truly random process. So, uh, the uh, the value of the factor or the realization of the factor at any point t and the realization of the factor at any later or earlier point t dash are not correlated in any way. And so, 
this is another important assumption that the uh, the values or the realizations uh, possible realizations of the uh, uh, of the factors at different points of any factor at different points in time are uh, uncorrelated completely and similarly the idiosyncratic term uh, is also uncorrelated across time that means the value of this random term at any point in time t and any point in time t dash are mutually uncorrelated so the above conditions are summarized by saying that the asset returns are generated by a linear factor model lfm i repeat the above conditions are summarized by saying that the asset returns are generated by a linear factor model. These risk factors themselves may be correlated. Please note, we have not put in any condition that F i and F c a should be uncorrelated. I repeat this is important. We have not put in any restriction, we have not put in any condition that F i and F c a need to be uncorrelated. They may be correlated for example, inflation and interest rates. The asset specific shocks for different stocks may also be correlated. Please note this is different to the single index model. And this is something which we had we had assumed as valid as necessary in the single index model, but that does not hold in this APT model. In the APT model, we have generalized this to accommodate or to include the fact that asset specific shocks for different stocks i and j may be correlated as would be the case for example, if some unusual event influenced all of these firms in a particular industry. Now, postulate number 2, pure arbitrage profits are impossible, pure arbitrage profits are impossible. That means what? That is why is it so rather? Why is it so? Because competition in financial markets uh, is so much is so extensive and the markets as a result of which become so efficient that an investor cannot earn a positive expected rate of return on any combination of assets without undertaking some incremental risk and without making some net investment of funds. So, please note this important point. It arises on account of the competition in the market and the consequential market efficiency. So, higher the market efficiency, in other words, uh, higher the market efficiency, uh, lower is the chance of making any arbitrage profits. So, we make this assumption that in the in the ideal case, pure arbitrage profits are impossible and, and no investor can earn a positive expected rate of return on any combination of assets without undertaking some risk and without making some net investment of funds. Now, what is the APT theorem? These were the postulates. The APT theorem is that given the postulates 1 and 2, the APT theorem says that there exist k plus 1 numbers p 0, p 1, p 2, p 3 up to p k not all 0 such that the expected return on the ith asset, the expected return on the ith asset is approximately equal to p 0 plus the sum over j of beta j times p j that is equation number 2. Expected return on a security i can be represented as the sum of p 0 and a sum of the product of the beta profile of the risk exposure profile of the uh, of this asset each term being multiplied by the by a particular number p 1, p 2, p 3 and p, p k. What are these p's? Now, uh, first of all this approximation is has been proved to hold substantially and as a result of which it may be replaced by the equality sign. So, now we come to the issue what are these PJs? These PJs are the price of risk just as we had the equity risk premium in the case of the CAPM model whatever the beta was we multiplied by the, by the expression uh, which represented the equity risk premium, but there was only one term there. Here what we are saying is that the entire set 
of beta as which represents the risk exposure profile of the asset is uh, multiplied by the corresponding values of the uh, risk price of risk uh, to arrive at and then the cumulative effect represents together with P0 the expected return on a security I. Now, what about the risk free rate? It is easy to see that the risk free rate is equal to the uh, to, the, to the term P 0. How do we see it? We imagine a portfolio P that is perfectly diversified that is for which the idiosyncratic risk or the unsystematic risk is 0 and with no factor exposures to any of this uh, risk factors. It has all beta is equal to 0 that means, it has no factor exposure to any of these risk contributors or risk sources which contribute to the total expected return on the portfolio. Then, beta p j is equal to 0 for all j equal to 1 to k and that means what? That means, the portfolio has 0 risk and from equation number 3 we find that it is expected return is equal to p 0. This p 0 must be the risk free rate of return. This is quite easy to see. Reasoning similarly, the risk premium now if you we can extend this logic this rational to define the various items of risk premium or risk price. Uh, reasoning Similarly, the risk premium or the risk price for the jth risk factor P j is the return in excess of the risk free rate earned on an asset that is, that is one unit of risk exposure to the jth risk factor that is the beta with reference to that particular risk factor is equal to 1 and 0 risk factors zero risk exposures with reference to the other factors. So, let me repeat if we have a portfolio that has one unit of uh, uh, one unit of sensitivity you may call it or the exposure to a particular risk factor let us say P, P j or P h and zero risk exposure with reference to uh, all the other risk factors then the excess return ex excess expected return over the risk free rate that is generated on that portfolio will be called the risk premium with a reference to that risk factor. The full APT is obtained by substituting. Now, we see the derivation of the full APT uh, theorem. Uh, the full APT is obtained by substituting uh, the expected return that is equation number 3 into equation number 1. The expected return is given by P 0 plus beta I 1 P 1 plus beta uh, up to I k P k. We are considering a uh, model with uh, k plus 1 uh, or rather k risk factors. Of course, P 0 is the risk free rate. Uh, we substitute this into equation 1 and we simplify a bit. When we simplify this expression, what we get is equation number 4. So, equation number 4 is e easily obtained simply by substituting equation number 3 in equation number 1. When you substitute the value of E of R i t into from equation number 3 in equation number 1 and rearrange the terms what we get is equation number 4. Now, again we come back to the CAPM versus APT relationship. It is at this level of the determination of expected returns that the CAPM model and the APT model differ. In the CAPM model, the expected excess return for an asset is equal to that asset's CAPM beta times the expected excess return on a market index even for multi-factor versions of the standard CPM. For such a multi-factor CAPM model to be true, the APT risk premium must satisfy a certain relationship. What is the relationship between the PIs of the APT model and the betas of the CAPM model? Let us now investigate that. So, relationship between the APT and the CAPM that is in essence what we are trying to work out is the relationship between the CAPM beta and the uh, APT uh, PI prices of risk or risk premium. Suppose that the CAPM were true for some market index of n assets. Let me repeat suppose that the CAPM was true for some market index of n assets. This asset has a return which we denote by RMT and has weights WM1, WM2, WMN of each of the n securities and the total sum of the weights is equal to 1. We assume this, this particular part of the exposition. Now, suppose 
also that in postulate 1 of the APT that that suppose also that postulate 1 of the APT holds that is that the n asset returns are generated by a linear factor model given by equation number 1. Then what do we have? We have r i t minus the expected value of r i t is equal to beta i 1 f 1 plus beta i 2 f 2 i is the security please note and 1, 2, 3 are the various risk factors that contribute to the total systematic risk. So, beta i 1 f 1 plus beta i 2 f 2 and beta i beta i j is the sensitivity of the security i to the risk factor j plus beta i k f k t plus the idiosyncratic risk term e or epsilon i t. We find the cap m restrictions rather that the APT risk prices must satisfy and this problem is solved by recognizing that the cap m beta for any asset can be computed as a linear function of this linear factor model risk exposures that is the cap m beta is equal to a linear function of the APT beta i j's. How do we do it? This is very interesting. The return on the market portfolio RMT is given by the weighted average return of its constituent securities. So, we have equation number A, it is straightforward. What does it say? It says that the return on the market portfolio is equal to the weighted average returns of the constituent securities. Also by APT, equation number 1 of the APT, we have that RIT minus the expected value of RIT is equal to beta i 1 f 1 t plus beta i 2 f 2 t plus beta i k f k t plus epsilon 1 t. And similarly for r 2 t, similarly for r 2 r 3 t and so on. For all these values for all the securities, security 1, security 2, security 3 and all these n securities, we have this expression which is represented by equation number B. So, R i t minus expected value of R i t is equal to f beta i 1 f 1 t plus beta i 2 f 2 t up to beta i k f k t plus the idiosyncratic risk. Therefore, if we substitute this value of R i t in equation number A from equation number B, uh, what we get is equation number C. It is a slightly extended equation, but I repeat what we have simply done is we have simply substituted the value of R 1 t, R 2 t, R 3 t up to R n t as obtained from equation number B in equation number A. We get equation number C. Now, rearranging equation number C, we have simply rearranged the terms of equation number C. We have done nothing else and we get equation number D. In, in essence, we have isolated the coefficients of f 1 t, f 2 t, f 3 t up to f k t and we have captured the other, the epsilon terms have been clubbed together and the, and the expectation value terms have been clubbed together. The beta m j is equal to w m 1 beta 1 j plus w m 2 beta 2 j plus so and so up to w m n beta n j. Please note, 1, 2, 3 uh, is the security number, mm, is the, the first suffix is the security number and the second security is the factor identity or the risk factor uh, identity. So, there are two suffixes, one first suffix is the security number and the second, sub security, uh, second suffix or the suffix of the suffix is the, uh, is the uh, factor number. So, j is equal to from 1 to k. Now, when we substitute this expression uh, in equation number d, what we get is equation number e. So, putting all this together, what we end up is equation number e. Now, this equation number e, what does it tell us? It tells us that the return on the market index is generated by a linear factor model with the various betas that are given by equation number f. You can see here in equation number e, if you compare this equation with the linear factor model equation, you find that it is valid term to term and therefore, this shows that the market return uh, uh, is also generated by a linear factor model with the betas which are given by the expression f. Now, the CA cap m beta for the ith asset is given by the expression which is here in equation number g. 
we know that very well um, beta of the is a, is a regression coefficient the cap m beta is a regression coefficient so it is given by the covariance between ri and rm uh, divided by the variance of the market square uh, divided by the variance of the market so this can be computed from the uh, from the linear factor model generating the return from the ith asset that is we use this equation uh, which is equation number b for substituting uh, for r i t in equation number g. I repeat, you substitute the value of r i t from equation number b in equation number g. What we get is this equation h and in, in equation h, we do some simplifications. Uh, what are the simplifications? Because of postulate 1, what we have is that the idiosyncratic risk is independent or is uncorrelated with n all the factor all the factor risks. Therefore, what we get is F i and R m. If you look at this F 1 and the epsilon term, uh, you'll, you'll look at this epsilon term here, the last term in equation h, what we find is uh, when you use this expression epsilon i with f j is equal to 0, what we are left with is the is the expression j. If you use e, if you use the uh, fact that the covariance between epsilon i and f j is equal to 0, and then what you find is that the relationship between epsilon i and r m t, because you see r m t is a is a linear combination of f 1 t, f 2 t, f 3 up to f k t and then there is an epsilon term, uh, but all the all the uh, um, all the factor terms uh, the covariance between all the factor terms and epsilon i t is 0 by in virtue of equation number 1. So, the only term that is left in r m is the is the uh, uh, is the epsilon term. So, what we have is that all other terms will vanish because R I, I repeat because R m t is a linear combination of the factors plus the epsilon term. So, and epsilon i with all these factors has a 0 covariance. So, when you take the covariance of epsilon i with R m t, the only term that survives is the term that is epsilon i t epsilon m t. Now, under the usual assumptions that the market index is well diversified and epsilon n t is approximately 0, this, this term will also vanish, this term will also man, vanish. So, what we have is epsilon i t r m t that is this term, the last term in equation h is completely 0, it totally vanishes. And that means what? That means beta i is equal to the expression that is given in equation number k. Please note the epsilon term has vanished because of the reasons that I explained in equation numbers i and equation number j. Now, if you look at the cap m model, if you look at the cap m model, it is captured by equation number l, where T b is the treasury bill rate uh, for a maturity of T and we, this captures the risk free rate. So, in other words, the risk free rate is epitomized by is represented by the T b treasury bill rate, which is the T b term. So, uh, we have the uh, we have using this uh, uh, using ex equation L substituting for beta i in equation L what we get is equation number m simply substituting for beta i from equation k in equation L what we get is equation number m. And when we compare this equation with the APT equation uh, in which corresponds to the uh, to this particular problem uh, that is equation number n, where again we are replacing the uh, the risk free rate by the treasury bill rate, what we get is equation number n. So, comparing equation number n and n, comparing equation number m and n, we arrive at the relationship between the various risk prices of the APT and the cap m betas as given by the expression that is equation number O. So, from here I will continue in the next lecture. Thank you.